Um, I'm also moving back to California to work as an RN. And our last but not least, okay, Eric Dive. Okay. Uh, I have no plans yet. I'm still applying for jobs, so we'll yeah. see. So um, I'm going to read a text from Mike Choi. Okay, this is all the way from Seattle, Washington, who uh, was the college director after uh, Pastor Lydia left. This is what he has to say for you guys. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 33 says, How believers were in one heart and mind and shared everything they had to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. And the seniors have been modeling the early church at KCPC for the past few years. All the ungrads know how selfless you guys have been, welcoming people in their homes and giving them their time, the most valuable currency in college, to help build a community that reflects Christ's love to us. I'm so humbled and learned so much from their posture of dependence on Christ through their struggling and wrestling and have grown to rely on them as my rock during my time in college ministry. I trust that Jehovah Jireh will provide for them and equip them for this next chapter of their lives. And I can just, you know, just paraphrase of what Pastor Lydia told me the last three years that she's been here before she moved to um, not as a as beautiful place called Hawaii, okay? And she said she just had so much joy. Do you know she, her plan was to stay in Cleveland only one year? She stayed three years during a pandemic, okay? And so she stayed here because she loved you guys so much. And you guys were the first class right? You guys are the class that went through the pandemic. You guys, I think historically, we'll look back at this year, uh, this, the, like the last few years as, as one of the most important years of, of human history, okay? And so I'm going to have some things to say afterwards, but if any of you guys want to say some few words, we have about 10 minutes or so, please, this is your time to give your final words, okay, before you go off to a new season. Some of you guys are leaving the land and going to Canaan. Okay, some of you guys are staying in the promised land. And so, what do you want to say to the congregation? Okay? If there's a long, awkward silence, we'll end it. Okay? Okay, so, please be, okay? Okay, I have that mic. Okay. Okay, go, Dave. Okay. Go. <laughs> um, I think it, it, it's really been fun. I think knowing myself and coming in during the pandemic. I think I remember Jordan. Our first time coming to KCPC was like in person. Was the last semester of her year, four weeks before the pandemic. Um, I don't know. I didn't know it was the it would be such a home. We've really been poured into. I think one thing I just want to ask for is continue prayer for. We'll be living very. Thank you. With any transition. In your prayers. Remind us continually that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made every step of the way.
sorry, one last thing. Um, if you could pray that we could also um, just fight any stagnancy in any form, whether that be spiritual, mental, physical stagnancy. I think um, we need a, a motivating push sometimes. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, the love uh, that you have given us over the, the past few years. I think um, though I was like, baptized before college and everything, like college is actually the time we make the faith really our own, I feel like, because you're on your own, making the choice to come here every week and fellowship. Um, and thanks to you, uh, my faith personally has been very um, rooted and, and more strengthened these past few years. And I think that's really important as we all may eventually move on from this church, or you can stay here forever. Um, that's fun too. So seeing how God works in every single one of you in different ways, but it's the same God is really incredible. So definitely don't take that for granted um, and let that inspire you to keep pursuing him as you move forward, wherever that is. Um, and to use that love to love on others, whether they're in this church or not, as you loved us so well. So thank you all very much. Hello. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, I, uh, I remember coming in pandemic, mid-pandemic freshman year, didn't know what was going on, had our senior years of high school kind of taken away from us, cut short, and then coming into freshman year of college, um, everything was on Zoom. Uh, I remember going to Leutner, our lunch halls, just grab and go. Um, but the one thing that truly gave me community personally, I think, was KSPC, this church. And I'm very, very thankful for each and every one of you guys, even if it was just a passing by interaction. Um, each one of you have made a huge impact in my life. and. Yeah, thank you so much for just absorbing me into your community. Um, I think all the seniors think the same way. And just giving us so many blessings. Um, and truly, uh, you guys have been my joy and um, a reason that have kept me strong in my faith, um, even though it was very weak from the pandemic coming into freshman year. So uh, thank you guys for just sticking by us uh, for all these four years now. And uh, yeah, just continue to pray for us. and. Um, hope that we can continue God's will and um, be rooted in our faith as well. Thank you so much. Shout out to my youth group kids too. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Anybody? Any? Any others? Still have? A, we still have some time. No. Okay. Go. Hey, Kathy. Um. Okay, so I want to say, like, KCPC has been a really good community for me. Um, in high school, like, before coming to college, um, I didn't really have, like, I just went to a church that, like, my parents took me to, but it wasn't very, there wasn't very much of a community. And then I came into college, and one of my first, like, my first two friends that I made was Hannah and Michelle. And it was just like so cool to find so many people who like are Christian and like I found a community here because there was just like, oh my gosh, like so many Christian college students. That's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I just thought it was really nice and like um, special shout out to Hannah and Michelle because they really, their faith in God and like the way that they pursue every day in a very like, um, God-driven manner has really inspired me to also grow in my faith. Um, so I really wish them the best of luck um, and, and how they have helped me develop as a individual as well. Um, and I also wanna shout out Jordan. Uh, I met him freshman year and it was just like really cool to see him also grow. And now he's like a leader at youth, for the youth group kids too. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I gotta say, just little special shout outs. Um, and I especially want to shout out someone who's not here today, 
um, Lydia, she really helped me through a lot um, throughout my college years because uh, there, there was a lot of like struggles that I went through. I don't really go around and share about them, but um, tears has been shed in front of Lydia. <laughs> um, and Lydia was so kind to like help me um, go through them and help me filter through them and like really brought a new perspective in my life to help me feel stronger in my faith. So special, special shout out to Lydia. Yeah, okay. Okay, any other seniors want to say anything? No pressure, anyone, anyone, anyone? Okay, um, before uh, Elder Phil comes up, um, we have uh, we have something special for you guys. Can you guys come up? Okay. Maybe maybe they should do a lineup. This, it says wanted. Maybe they should do a lineup. Okay. Okay. Can um can you seniors put it in front of you and then we can take a if someone maybe one of you guys can take a picture. Okay. okay, seniors, face this way. You're going to take a little quick picture. Grace, Grace and Hannah, face that way, guys. Face that way. I'm going to take a quick picture, okay? Okay. Okay, just stay up here. Um, just before Elder Phil comes up and pray for you guys, just, I, I just want to just reiterate, the seniors, this class, you've gone through so much. You guys were really the foundation, the pillars and the, of, of this ministry here. When we had no leaders, we had no, Mike and Lydia all left. You kept the ship, steering in the right way. And so you guys are a special class. I know I say that every year, but this is truly, so true of you guys. And so Elder Phil's going to come up and pray for us, pray for you guys, actually. Thanks, Pastor Shea. So as a uh, college professor, I know there's some colleagues in here who are faculty as well. One of the things that I always say at the beginning of the course is if you want to pass my class, you have to show up. Um, so that is like, you know, college 101. Um, but then beyond that, uh, not just showing up, be actively engaged. And uh, so I just want to encourage you guys and exhort you guys to continue to show up continue to be actively engaged in whatever you do. You've done that already for our church. We're grateful for that. Um, and you're going to continue to do that. So let me, let's bow our heads. We're going to pray for them. It says in Romans 15, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Lord, we thank you for the seniors. We thank you for who they are. We thank you that you have led them here for the time being, and now you are sending some of them off. Lord, would you allow them to abound in hope? Lord, would they be actively engaged wherever they may be for your name and for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give one more round of applause. Good job. Well done. You guys can sit down. Just forgot, just a, um, also, we have a cake for you guys as well. And so we got to have a cake for you guys as well. And also, just to, I didn't mention this, but we, I believe we have food today. And so please let this middle section so the praise team can move their equipment, okay? Uh, just to encourage you as well that um, I know it's already late, but my sermon is significantly shorter. Okay, if we can turn to two passages today, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9, and Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And then Matthew 4, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the word of God. 
And so I, I know this, this message is going to be primarily for you guys, but also for you guys as well. But I don't know if you guys have noticed that a vast majority of commencement addresses, they kind of give the same kind of messages. I mean, once in a while, you'll find something radical, something different, surprising, but it goes like this, okay? Think for yourselves. Don't trust what your parents have told you. Don't trust what we experts at the university told you. Don't trust anybody. Don't let anyone tell you what to do, even though they're ironically telling you what to do right now, okay? But do what you want to do. You are you, right? Every commencement address is in, in one sense or an order like that. But the most important thing for you to do is for you to think for yourselves. Don't listen to any other voice, but think to yourself. Just listen to your heart. Now, initially, right, this claim seems so liberating and so radical and new, right? But I don't think there's a message that's more conformist, more socially conventional message than when today's culture says to think about yourself, to think only of yourself, or think, you know, think for yourself, okay? You know, I just want to remind you, seniors, that the university has absolutely no clue what you're supposed to be doing in life. They have no clue what you should think and how to think. But you know what they're like? They're like, thank you so much for giving us $71,000 a year to not need our wisdom and our knowledge and our expertise so that you can think for yourself. Now, obviously, you do think for yourself. But when m mentors or professors keep telling you, think for yourself, think for yourself, think for yourself, what happens? You only think for yourself. You don't, you don't take any other advice to heart. And it seems sure that our culture sure seems like it's thinking for themselves. One poll says that 91% of us admit that we lie at a regular basis. 91% of you guys lie regularly. 35% of those who are married admit to having an extramarital affair. 35%. 86% of youth lie regularly to their parents. You parents, 86% lie regularly to their parents. 75% lie regularly to their best friends. 75%, okay? 0% of them ever lie to their pastors. I'm just kidding about that, okay? I'm just kidding about that. One in five loses his or her virginity before the age of 13. I mean, think about this. An extramarital affair here, immorality here, a lie here. And before we know it, we're kind of thinking for ourselves, aren't we? That kind of culture. You know, earlier I gave an alternative uh, worldview, epistemology you know, of our culture. And it's from Jesus in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to 9. And interesting, in the book of Mark, Jesus quotes this passage, okay? And Jesus simply says, you know the answer to life. You know it. We're to love God with all of our strength and soul and mind, and, heart, soul and mind and strength, and to love our neighbor as well. That's it. This is Torah. This is truth. This is not your truth. It's not my truth. It's not your case professor's truth. It is the truth. This is veritas, right, in Latin. Your job is merely to be able to handle the truth, okay? And so listen, you may not know a lot about Christ today. Maybe you don't know that much about Christ ever. But I, I do want you to know about, uh, this about Christ, that you're to love God with everything you got to the very depths of your soul and your neighbor as, your, as yourself. Class dismissed. You're done. Let's get your $284,000 back, okay? And you can go home without any debt anymore. Okay? And so people who follow Jesus and who, people who follow Jesus, God in Israel 2,000 years ago, okay, they bow down to their gods. And we have our gods, don't, don't we? You know what these gods are called? Their gods are called Eros, Jupiter, Zeus, Caesar, Hercules, Hercules, Achilles, Brad Pitt. Okay? Your, your gods are Google, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA. Amazon, Hollywood, Cleveland Clinic, Metro, UH, DUH, duh, you know what I'm saying? That's our gods, okay? Isn't it, funny how, isn't it funny who we worship and what we worship? But real authentic worship is very, very simple. Love God with everything you got, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else flows from that, okay? And so these words of Deuteronomy, they advise kids, teach them to your kids, I mean. Paint them over the doors of your dormitory. 
or your parents' basement, because that's where many of you guys will be living for the next few years, okay? Put this on your forehead. Tattoo them on your biceps, as long as they don't sag. But I want you guys to realize, because this Deuteronomy passage is in huge collision with, with knowing God, okay? I mean, I'm sorry, of, of, of thinking for yourself only. This culture all talks about you, 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 you. And all we do is create a culture of narcissists. When people tell you constantly, over and over, to only think about yourself, only think for yourself, what kind of culture does that create? A bunch of selfish, self-absorbed narcissists. But the Bible says this. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And so this passage clearly tells you, just don't think for yourself. Now, I'm not saying for you to never think about you. I'm not saying that. But when you only think for yourself and don't listen to any other wisdom, that will destroy you. That's a recipe for disaster. And so have you noticed, before he gives us the greatest commandment, he gives us some auditory words, these verse here, listen, speak, tell. Unlike case or other institutions of higher learning, okay, Israel's sons and daughters, they didn't have to invent the secrets of life. You too, you don't have to invent the secrets of life. I believe your parents loved you enough to tell you the truth. Their parents 2,000 years ago taught their kids the truth. And wisdom primarily in the Old Testament and the New Testament is depicted as an older person, someone in the older generation dispensing their wisdom. It's an intergenerational gift. Because honestly, 22 years old or 23 or 24, depending how much you elongated your time in college, is way too young for you to understand life. You older people, amen? Okay, you those who are 50, those who are older, 55 and above, don't you agree? Okay? I, 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 I'm saying this sarcastically, but I agree with that great theologian from Dublin, Ireland, Oscar Wilde, who was not a theologian, okay? He wrote, he wrote that book, The Picture of Dorian Gray. This is what he said. About the worst advice you could give anybody, the worst advice you can give anybody is to tell them to be yourself. Okay? The worst advice you can give to somebody is to tell them to be yourself. How can you be yourself if you don't even know who you are yet? Do you understand? God has told you who you are. God has given you wisdom. I love what Walter Brueggemann said, okay? I had lunch with him one day. He said this, a Bible-less world in which there are many gods and no neighbors is a world just full of idols and enemies. Maybe that's why we're so fatigued as we rush from one God to another. Before long, after you bow down to enough altars, the only posture you know is that of bowing. So accustomed have we become to submitting to so many different gods, the nation, your job, the corporation, your own ego, all the while rattling our chains and pitifully asserting to the whole world how free you are. Since we learned to bend ourselves before so many gods, there's almost nothing to which we will not stoop to do. Do you understand? When you have so many gods in your life, you cannot love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And you cannot love your neighbor. Everything is a matter of currency. Everything is utilitarian. Okay? Because the world is driven by competing, narcissistic, savagely self-interested people who constantly rationalize the behaviors, who don't have godly mentors, who don't feed on the word of God, they feed more on Machiavelli's The Prince or Sunsa The Art of War and not from the very words of God himself, okay? But the Bible, the Bible, you know, you know the great thing about the Bible? We always want to brag about how countercultural we are. The Bible is the most countercultural literature ever written, okay? And it has a wisdom that is intergenerational, that is public, that is cultural, cultural historical. And the beautiful thing is, you don't have to only think for yourself. You have a whole community of godly people who've gone before you. You know, there's many people who've exited this building, who've come before you guys. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses who have lived longer than you guys have, more faithfully than you guys have, who've taught you guys so much these past four years. They're cheering you guys on. They're watching YouTube right now or later on video about you guys to run this race well. Could you imagine? Kathy kind of mentioned this earlier. Could you imagine of living the last four years with no mentors at all? No Lydia's, no Mike, 
maybe no pastor, maybe that'd be better. I don't know, you know what I'm saying? No people who are older than you, who reached out to you when you were you in a freshman class. Didn't you, your freshman class, didn't you tell me how blessed you were by the senior class? How much wisdom they dispensed on, on them? Many of them helped you think beyond yourselves. So be encouraged that this new world of you, yours is not something that you have to figure out yourself. You have a community of godly mentors and parents that can guide you. And the last thing, the second thing, you don't have to live, if you don't want to live in this kind of cultural epistemology, worldview, I want you to enter into a covenant with God today. We live in a day of biblical illiteracy. You know, the giant paradox about our world, our, our people in America, is we, people say they respect the Bible, they believe in the Bible, too bad they don't know the Bible. Okay, one poll says that 83% of all Americans believe the Bible to be the revealed word of God, but only over 50% have never read the word of God. Half of those who attend church on a regular basis can name the four gospels, only half. Less than half know who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Less than half can name three of the Ten Commandments. And over 35% thought that the epistles were the wives of the apostles. I'm just kidding. I made that up, okay? Okay? Just wanted to see if you guys were listening, okay? But I hope and pray that you guys can be students of the Bible, that you don't just get informed. So what's the purpose of reading the Bible? You know, when Jesus was tempted to turn the stones into bread after 40 days of not eating, this is what he says. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6. And so to be fed from the word of God is a precious thing. You're going to be, you're going to be feeding on something. Instagram, social media, the news, your culture, your, your, whatever. Because what food is for the body, words are to the soul. What food is for the body, the words are to the soul. And so what you eat is going to assimilate in you. And words are to the soul. It becomes a part of you. It becomes what energizes you. And so what food is the body, words are to the soul. What shapes your body is food. Trust me, if someone eats steaks every day, every single meal, their body's going to be shaped like a steak. And so the kind of food that you eat makes a difference. You are what you eat. Don't you hear that all the time physically? I mean, aren't there certain people that you associate on Instagram or TikTok, whatever you watch, you, watch, you associate them with a specific food? Like, isn't there a guy from like Argentina who has sunglasses, he's really good looking, he cuts steak? I associate steak with him. Aren't there other like Korean grandmothers that go to like different restaurants and you associate Korean food with them, okay? Whenever I think of Buddha Jige, I think of Sam, because he loves it. Okay, I associate that with him. And so what shapes your heart and your mind and your spirit are words on a very human level. It affects you. You know, when a father says to a child, I love you on a regular basis, those words shape that child's heart. I, I read this some years ago of an Asian father in Southern California who had a son in second grade. True story. Excuse my language. But he brought a D minus to uh, his dad one day. He's in second grade, like seven to eight years old. You know what this Asian father says to him? Do you know why you got a D minus? It's because you're stupid. You're stupid. Please repeat after me. I'm stupid. He had his son repeat over and over again that he's stupid. Those words shapes him or misshapes him. The words that we listen to, that we read and meditate on, on shapes us. There are, the, there are ways that we, we look at the world that we look at ourselves, okay, and about other people. And so what food is to the body, the body is to the soul. And so to be fed by the word of God is to allow God's thoughts and his words to shape us. And they shape how you look at yourself, how you look at the world and other people, the way you think and you feel and you act. It, it makes you interpret relationships, world events, books, movies. It, it makes you interpret life gives you a knowledge how to live life, how to think beyond yourself. That means you have to be fed. I know you don't like hearing this. You have to be fed from the word of God constantly, or you will not have a chance. There is no hope for people who don't read the word of God regularly, because you will listen to other voices of culture. And most of all, you will be transformed by it. You will have an opportunity to be transformed by it and be more like Christ. So I want you to get in the covenant to be fed from the word of God. You know, when you fall in love, the first time someone says, I love you, not your mommy or your daddy, okay? When they says, I love you, 
When they say, I love you, what happens? You replay them over and over and over in your mind. And eventually you start believing, oh my gosh, she or he loves me. Okay, don't you? You meditate on it. How do you say it in Chinese? Yo ai ni, well actually yo is Spanish, sorry. Wo ai ni, right? Wo ai ni. Someone says, well, how do you say it in, uh, in Korean? Salad heo, salad heo. Sarang, oh, it's not salad, I hate salad. Uh, sarang heo, sarang heo. And someone says that over and over to you. You start believing it. And that's, what, that's what's happened when you read scripture. For example, when you read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, to reflect on that and to live in it and to replay it over and over again, you start believing in it, it starts taking over you and you start actually believing that Jesus is your shepherd. He will guide you into still waters. It becomes part of you. You perceive things differently. So if you continue to feed on the word of God, you will have a fighting chance to live in the kingdom of God in the mess that's called the world. And so if you really think about it, if you only think for yourself, it's really no thinking at all, okay? You're believing the lies of the culture. You will allow them to control what you should think. Isn't that interesting, okay? So my prayer for you seniors is this, okay? May the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart be pleasing to God. So have godly mentors. Be part of a Christ-centered community and keep feeding on the word of God so you don't merely think for yourselves, to live for yourselves, but to live for God and his glory and his kingdom. Because if you do it, if you do the other way, it's a recipe for disaster. And so that is my last charge to you seniors. Whatever you take, it away, take away from you, trust me, you think life has been tough, you're about to enter the arena. Okay, the it's wor they're worse than gladiator, and they're worse than wild animals. Okay, trust me, ask the older people. You're gonna people who are gonna betray you, who are gonna stab you in the back, who are gonna mess with you, all because of pride and ego. They all thought for themselves. May God's thoughts lead you to the promised land. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. This senior class, it's truly special. Just everything they talked about was just centered on you, how you changed them, how you used godly mentors to change them, how they want to reach out, how they want prayer. I pray they will truly be in a godly community, that they will not compromise in that, in, in, in that, um, in that thinking, that they will not just join a community that's just fun or just shallow. They truly be in a God-centered community with godly mentors. And then they themselves... May we'll make a covenant with you that they will be regularly be feeding from the word of God so they may be filled and not believe the lies of this world, but believe in your thoughts, your love for them, and your love for their neighbors. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If we could all stand up for the final song.
bless you and keep you. May his face be upon you and be gracious to you. And may the light of his countenance bring you shalom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you.